Hello, welcome to the Embedded Systems and Applications lecture. In this lecture, we are going to talk about real-time operating systems. Specifically, we will talk about processes or tasks and threads. In the next lecture, part 2 of this real-time operating system series, we will talk about task scheduling and some of the scheduling algorithms in a multitasking system. So some of the questions that we are going to look at specifically are what is an operating system? What constitutes a process or a task? And how are they scheduled efficiently? What are threats? And what are some of the constraints when designing a real-time operating system. Now, a real-time operating system is an operating system which has to perform applications in a responsive manner, in a very strictly time-bound manner. And then we will look at some applications, some real-time operating system examples that can be implemented on ARM Cortex M3 microcontroller. Now, what is an operating system? Well, per definition, an operating system is a software layer between the application software and the hardware. Well, for the applications that we do in the lab, for the projects and the games that we program in the lab on the LPC 1768 microcontroller, they are rather simple. They do not need a separate operating system um, to help us run the application. They are simple. So the application software can directly operate on the microcontroller hardware. But as systems get more and more complex and more and more complicated, we need a specific um, software component that handles the housekeeping jobs when there are many tasks, for example, in an application. There has to be some mechanism to keep track of all, all the housekeeping responsibilities. So, in a complex application software, when that needs to be deployed on my microcontroller, we use an operating system to help us orchestrate the different tasks that are running on an application. So, in more complex systems, we have an operating system sitting between the application software and coordinating um, and sitting between the application software and the microcontroller. Now, there can be multi-core um, systems where there are more than one process processors and then the application software can be um, integrated to the different codes using a very um, effective real-time operating system. Now, the way a typical embedded system solves a problem is by decomposing it into smaller pieces. They are called tasks. These tasks work together in an organized way. So what happens is, um, typically, and this is a, a typical task management principle, the idea is um, you want to break down a complicated task into smaller bite-sized chunks that are more manageable. For example, let's say um, you, want to, you want to prepare for your EE379 or EE500 final exam. So having a goal of preparing for final exam is a bit more challenging and much more daunting than saying, let me start with one task. Let me decompose the process of preparing for the final exam into smaller, more manageable parts. Let me start by reviewing lecture 12 or 13 today. That's a much more um, a 
achievable, much more manageable task. So um, I would recommend um, this lecture by Professor Randy Posh, which is on YouTube, and then he talks about many things. This is this lecture is part of um, the last lecture series at Carnegie Mellon University, and he talks about many um, of his life experiences, among which um, he goes at good length details into time management, and I um, recommend it. The main idea again is to break down complex tasks into simple to-do tasks, in, into simple to-do list um, that is much more manageable. And that is exactly what an operating system does. Break down a complicated, complex application into smaller um, tasks. So a system um, is called multitasking system. Such a system um, which has many tasks is called a multitasking system. And some of the design aspects of a multitasking system um, include sharing data between different tasks. When one task finished execution, it needs to send the output to another task. Task 2 is perhaps waiting for task 1 to finish and then the result to be transferred. So this kind of data transfer, data exchanges between the different tasks. That is something, um, one of the um, design, system design aspects in a multitasking system. Synchronizing tasks. When does one task end and when does the next task begin? So this is also a main design consideration um, in a multitasking system. Also, scheduling tasks. Which task, when there are two tasks, for example, competing for the processor, the a, a very important design consideration is which of these two tasks, task one or task two, has higher priority? Which task is more urgent? Which task is more realistically um, able to meet its deadline? So what, which has higher priority? So scheduling different tasks depending on their priorities, depending on urgencies and other considerations. That is also a very important criteria. So there is a really nice mechanism. Operating system is this piece of software that provides this um, functionality and others. So this orchestration and coordination or housekeeping um, when managing different tasks is provided by the operating system. So um, let us define a real-time operating system here. When a control system must ensure that the task satisfies a set of very specified time constraints, then such an operating system is called a real-time operating system. Okay, so an operating system with very tight time budget, time constraints. That is a real-time operating system. And we encounter real-time operating system from time to time in safety critical applications where um, time is of the essence. So um, to think of the, to understand the multitasking mechanism um, in a much more mundane and relatable example, let's talk uh, about a dinner party. Let's say you are hosting a dinner party. As a host, you have invited um, your friends and relatives over for an evening of gourmet meal, uh, music, and socializing. Now, you're planning a perfect banquet. In order for this perfect ba banquet to materialize, you, you want to make sure that all dishes um, all the delicacies are um, ready at the same time. You don't want your um, dessert or you don't want your main course to be ready much ahead and be cold um, and spoiled um, in time for the party. You want to make sure that all the um, dishes are um, available and ready at the 
same time. But uh, there is only one of you cooking and um, preparing these dishes. Um, we, you have to ration your time wisely. So um, let's look at um, a flow chart for how your task might look like. You want to start by setting menu um, and then there are different courses. You're preparing your stock, you're preparing your meat, you're pre cleaning your veggies, um, you're cleaning your fish and fruit. So the idea is think of each of these um, courses of meal as a task. Okay, you want to, you, you, you obviously cannot work on all of these um, at the same time. You have to switch between working, preparing the stock and preparing the meat and cleaning the veggies. You have to um, move them forward together um, even though it is not possible to work on um, two of these at the same time. So in other words, this is the idea of concurrency when there are multiple tasks that your operating system has to schedule. Only one task can have the processor at any given instant of time. But if the processor is switching between multiple tasks fast enough and then advancing each task just a little bit and then moving on to the next task and advancing it a little bit further, then all of these tasks are um, executing in parallel. That is exactly what you are doing with your menu what you're how you're cooking you start with the stock you add your veggies and then while they're um while your stock is brewing you mo move on to marinating your meat and then um while your meat is marinating you let it marinate and you clean your veggies once you finish one cycle of all of this you will come back to pick up where you left off with the um, stock you manage the seasoning so in other words you are handling multiple tasks in parallel. You are processing them in parallel, but only working on one task at a, at a time. So this idea is called concurrency. This idea is called concurrency. All right, um, so so exactly is the same um, scenario for an operating system trying to orchestrate and schedule different tasks. Okay, so the common approach to design an application, uh, embedded system application, follows the exact same pattern. The application comprises of a number of tasks that must be completed. Um, and the CPU, just like you are the only cook available, CPU is a very valuable resource um, and unless you are um, dealing with multi-core processors, in which case the fundamental architecture, the fundamental idea is more or less similar. Um, in a single CPU, single processor um, systems, the, C the processor has to be shared among the different uh, modules okay and then with careful design if we switch between these tasks fast enough um, each of these smaller modules or tasks will naturally um, become one task that make up um, one of the tasks that make up an application all right so typically an embedded system is a static entity it does not um, it does not um, do anything unless it is running or executing all right when a firmware module is executing it is called a process or a task a task um, is usually typically implemented um, in C um, uh, by writing a C function All right, so um, when a process or a task is created, it is allocated a number of resources. 
the processor task needs a lot of these resources in order for it to execute. We know um, one of the resources itself is the CPU. CPU is a very um, valuable, very um, extremely powerful, um, valuable resource. In addition to the CPU, there are other pro other um, resources that are needed. A process stack, a memory address space, some registers, a program counter, and some access to the input-output ports, peripherals, um, network connections, file descriptions, and um, API, and other, other resources. So in other words, a process needs a lot of resources in addition to CPU. So some of these resources, for example, the process stack, memory address space, these, some of these are not shared with other processes. On the other hand, CPU is shared with um, a lot of other processes. CPU is shared with um, a lot of other processes. Now, what happens is, as a process or um, task is running during the execution, the, pro the contents of the program counter are continually changing. They move, um, they move to point to the next instruction to be executed within the program. And then the instructions themselves um, can read, um, write, or manipulate data. Well, I should say the next instruction, the next instruction um, to be fetched um, is identified by, identified by the program counter. And the uh, present values of data in memory or in registers are collectively called as process state. This is important to understand um, when we have to um, get a, an idea of context switching or switching between different tasks. Okay, Before we halt the current task and move on to the next task, what we have to do is we have to take a snapshot of the current status of the task one. We save the current status of task one and then move on to task two. Okay, And we execute task two for some time. And before exiting task two, we take a snapshot of the status of task two, save it and come back and restore the snapshot. So in other words, we want to come back where we left off. For example, we move on from task one to task two, and then we want to come back to task one and pick it up where we left off. And in order to do that, we need to be able to save a snapshot of the current task status. And to do that, we have to um, save the current process state just before switching to a different process or task. Now, there can be different types of tasks. There can be periodic tasks, tasks that repeat on a regular um, time interval. There can be intermittent tasks, intermittent tasks are repetitive tasks that do not repeat on a regular interval, but are um, repetitive not with a very specific time interval. And then there are background tasks. These are not extremely critical. These are soft real-time or non-real-time tasks. And they are um, accomplished only if CPU is available, if CPU time is available. And then there are, of course, complex tasks. Examples include Microsoft Word. So periodic tasks are typically found in hard real-time applications. They, for example, some kind of um, time period. For every 
10 milliseconds generate any interrupt or, or a any task that is repeating on a specific interval intermittent task examples of intermittent tasks include sending an email um, every morning 4 a.m or calibrating a sensor on startup or saving all data when power goes down these are not um, these are not um, periodic tasks but they need to be performed repeatedly when the specific event happens now the traditional view of computing focuses on the program as opposed to um, the point of view that we as embedded um, applications designers we take we like to take a more processor centric view a processor centered approach cpu is a very um valuable resource is a resource and then um, we want to quantify everything in terms of um, cpu downtime or cpu um, busy time so um, let's define a quantity here um, here are again some of the um, resources associated with the process um, and then CPU the one shown in green um, makes itself available to um, the process or task here okay so let's um, define a quantity called execution time execution time is the time it takes a task to complete from begin to end that is called execution time okay so this is a single process system in a single process system when a task enters the system it takes up uh, resources it takes up memory and other system resources and as a matter of fact what happens is the CPU is available to the task for the entirety of um, of um, time so in other words there is no other process or task to compete for the processor and so uh, because there is no contention for resources um, there will be um, no restrictions on how long the task can typically run that's not the case in multi-process systems in multi-process systems, it is very common to have resource contention problems because CPU just like you are the only cook available that has to um, ration your time between the different tasks all the way from um, brewing the stock to cleaning the veggies to marinating the meat all of these different tasks have to be accomplished by you and you alone even so in a multitasking system the processor has to um, make itself available to different tasks on a time shared basis so um, the main resource CPU is given to different tasks in a time multiplex fashion very similar um, to you rationing your um, time in cooking different dishes so when you switch between different tasks fast enough when the CPU switches between different tasks fast enough it will appear as if um, all the tasks are running at the same time so it gives us an appearance um, of multitasking system but in reality in systems where there is just one processor even if we call them as multitasking system only one task is executing at the same time but um, we are switching between these tasks so fast that it appears like all these tasks are running in parallel so what is this kind of scheme called this kind of mechanism we gave a name to it earlier it is called concurrent we say all these tasks are running concurrently 
So the concept can be extended to more than two tasks. When there are two or more tasks that need to be um, scheduled, the processor can switch among them fast enough to give an appearance of concurrent parallel uh, processing while only one task is running at any given instant of time. So here, see the processor, um, there are not, three processors are not present here. There is only one process, but what is happening is in this animation, the processor is switching fast enough between these three processes. The CPU is switching fast enough between these three um, processes that to a naked eye, to us, it appears that the CPU is performing all these tasks at the same time. So this is the idea of multitasking system. We like to call it concurrent. execution. So when I say a multitasking system or concurrent execution, what I really mean is that um, only one task is executing at any given instant in time, but um, the CPU is switching between these tasks or processes so fast that they appear to be all running at the same time. That's the idea of concurrent tasks. So CPU, as we mentioned earlier, is not the only resource. There are other resources as well. There are um, other resources like timers, input-output ports, and buses. These are all resources. Some of these are shared. CPU is shared as well. And some of the resources are not shared. Some of the resources like uh, memory address space, the program counter, or the or the stack, a uh, process stack. These, those are the resources that are not shared, but um, the resources like timers, input output facilities, and buses, these are all um, shared among different processes. So let me repeat again that despite the illusion that all of the tasks are running simultaneously, in reality, at any instant in time, only one process is actively um, executing. When there are two tasks or when there are two processes, process one and process two, at any given instant in time, only one process, P1, is running or executing. So when P2 is executing, for example, P1 is waiting for the processor. CPU is with um, P2. All right, but when CPU um, halts running P2 and then moves on to executing P1, then uh, P2 is not running anymore. P1 is running, but P2 is waiting. Okay, so. Um, at any given instant in time, when one process is running, there can be one or more processes that are ready and waiting for the CPU. Now, um, at any instant in time, only one process is um, in the run state and there can be multiple processes. So there is only one process in the run state. There can be uh, multiple processes. All in the waiting state. And one process in the running state. So th typically, here is how it looks. Process task zero is currently running and all other tasks are waiting. And when task one is running, all the other tasks are, so task two is waiting, task zero is waiting, and task one is running. Here, um, task zero is running, 
task 1 is waiting and task 2 is waiting. Similarly, when task 2 is running, the remaining 2 are waiting. And we can extend that further. So the bottom line again is the processor is shared among these different tasks and when a task is not running it is in the waiting state. Now an important consideration is when there are multiple tasks how are they scheduled? The question really becomes which task has to be scheduled ahead of the other tasks, which task has higher priority. So in other words, when the operating system, real-time operating system is um, looking at different tasks in the waiting state, there are tasks P1, P3 and P4 in the waiting state. Now, um, which of these tasks, let's say P2 is currently running, P0, and P1 are waiting. When P2 finishes execution, the question that the real-time operating system has to ask is, am I going to schedule P0 to execute next or am I going to schedule P1 to execute next? So this um, priority, which, ta which of these two tasks, P0 or P1, has priority over the other. So this is the idea behind task scheduling. Okay, A schedule um, is set up to specify when, under what conditions, and for how long each task will be given the use of CPU and other resources. Now, there has to be a uniform, a strategy, a foolproof strategy, a well thought out um, philosophy um, in scheduling different tasks. So, what the operating, real time operating system does is it takes into account several criteria. The criteria for deciding which task is to run next they are collectively called as a scheduling strategy. And then the scheduling strategy generally falls into three categories. Multi-programming, real-time and time-sharing strategies. We are going to look at these strategies, scheduling algorithms in the next class. In multi-programming paradigm, each task continues until it performs an operation that requires waiting for an external event. So in other words, when a processor, when a process gets access to the processor, it does not let go of the processor until the process is waiting for an input from something else. Okay, In real time, operating system in real-time scheduling strategy tasks with specified specific time deadlines they are guaranteed um, to complete before those deadlines expire okay so the main consideration in a multi-programming system is that the task should have access to the processor as long as it is um, needing the processor as long as it is not waiting for something else. That is the criteria. In a real-time um, task scheduling um, uh, scheme, the main criteria is that we want to meet specific deadlines. If, if a task has a really close deadline, it is more likely that this task will have access to the processor. And then in a time sharing scheme, running task is required to give up um, the CPU 
after a specific amount of time okay so in other words what happens is when there are five different tasks in the time sharing scheduling scheme processor is available to each of these tasks only for a specific amount of time okay after 10 seconds expires 10 milliseconds expires for example after 10 milliseconds the um, processor stops executing the current task t1 and moves on to the next task t2 and the processor performs t2 for 10 milliseconds and then moves on to the next task so on and so forth time cpu time is shared across different tasks that's the time sharing scheme in a scheduling strategy now when the current task is stopped and we have to switch to another task this mechanism is called context switching much like a uh, context switching is very similar to um, handling an interrupt what happens when an interrupt occurs? The current main program, the current program is halted. We save the current state of the program to a stack. And then we move on to executing the interrupt service routine. When that ISR is handled, we come back to where we left off. We retrieve the snapshot of the main program and continue doing whatever we were doing. So um, a tasks context switching is also very similar in that respect. So a tasks context comprises the important information about the current status or the state of the task. So a snapshot of all these values um, the CPU registers, the value of the program counter, and then um, a lot of other um, other variables are saved to the stack. And then uh, the current task is stopped, and then the next task is handled. So each time that a running task is stopped, preempted, or blocked, the CPU is given to another task that is ready. So a switch to a new context or a new task is um, executed. This is called context switch. And as we discussed, before we can switch from task one to task two, we have to, before we let go of task two, we have to save its current state so we can come back from where we left off. So um, when we want to come back to task one, so what we have done is we are currently running task one, but um, after some time, we want to switch the context to task two. Sure, we save the current context to a stack. We save the current status of task one to a stack and then move on to task two. And then after some further time with task two what we have to do is we want to come back to task one how do we do that um, we save uh, the current status of task two and then um, move on to task one and retrieve um, from the stack where we left off so um, there are new tasks and there are previously running tasks. Previously running tasks um, are restored from where they left off, from where they were left off, and new tasks start from their initial values. As you can see here, um, a context change or a context switch entails a lot of work and a lot of housekeeping um, and this is handled um, 
this takes a lot of time but it is handled by the um, operating system so an operating system to put things in context here an operating system handles the housekeeping uh, business of switching between different tasks scheduling tasks according to priority and making sure that these context switch happens in a really seamless and transparent manner to the application user. Uh, that is the job of operating system among uh, other things. So uh, here is a block diagram of possible states that a task can be in. We know for sure when a task can be in running state. A task can be running if it has the CPU. And when a task finishes its job, it goes to um, exit. It is exited. When a new task is coming into the system, it has to sit in the new or entry um, state. And then when uh, there are more than one task, when P2 is currently running, there can be some tasks, P1, P3, and P4, process 1, process 3, process 4, that can be ready and waiting. But there can be other tasks as well, P5, P6, process 5, process 6, that um, are actually waiting for an input from a different task, or waiting for an input from a, an input-output device. Those kinds of tasks um, that don't need the CPU immediately, but they are in need of other um, resources. They, they are um, in the blocked or waiting state because they are waiting for other resources. Now, in a ready or waiting state, the processes P1, P3 and P4 have everything they need except CPU. So, um, in ready and waiting state, they are not waiting for any other resource, they are just waiting for CPU. In blocked or waiting state, they are waiting, waiting for inputs from other peripherals. A new task is just entering into the system. So, um, and a few other few other um, important points. Any task, if it needs to get into the running state, into the executing state, it has to come from ready or waiting state. Let me say that one more time. Any task that needs to enter the executing state has to come from the ready and waiting state. So in other words, input to the executing state is only from the ready and waiting state. So note that no other state can lead to executing state. Okay, In the executing state, CPU is available. All right, so there are primarily four states, running or executing state, ready to run but not running state, waiting state, waiting for some other um, resource other than CPU, and then inactive state. So when a task moves from one state to another state, that entails, that is referred to as context switching. Only one task can be running at a time as we know unless we use a multi-core CPU. So task waiting for CPU is ready to run. And then when a task has requested input output or put itself to sleep it is automatically switched to the waiting state. 
So we have to, I have to mention here that each of these states except executing state and um, terminated or exit state, they have Q associated with them. First in, first out mechanism. So when a task just enters the system, it will be sitting in the new or entry queue. When a, when a task is um, moving into the ready or waiting state, it will be added at the end of a um, ready or waiting queue. So in other words, process P1, P2, P3 are already in the ready waiting state. When a new task enters, it goes into a P into a queue, um, a queue as in first in first out queue. Okay, the same is the case with blocked or waiting um, states. So a data structure called queue um, keeps a list of all the waiting or blocked tasks. Now, I mentioned about the resources that are necessary for a process. For a process to execute, it needs resources. So when a process is created by the operating system, when a task is created by operating system, it is given a portion of the physical memory. It is given uh, some, it is allocated some um, space in the physical memory. The set of addresses um, delimiting that code and the data um, are proprietary to the process, it is called um, address space. So um, the set of addresses um, which correspond to the data um, and uh, data and instructions specific to this process is called its address space. Now in order to ensure the safety of processes, when there are three processes, for example process one, process 2 and process 3, you want to safeguard each of these processes from corrupting each other. So you want to make sure that process 1 does not encroach into the uh, address space of process 2 and process 2 does not inadvertently corrupt um, the program for process 3. So in other words, in order to make your embedded system application very reliable and robust, you want to make sure that each of these processes do not correspond, do not corrupt the other. And how do you do that? We ensure the safety and reliability of embedded system applications and processes by using what is known as a privileged mode supervisor mode. So you segregate the different processes and assign um, priorities to them. You assign these processes P1, P2, P3 are handled not by the user but by the supervisor, by the operating system. So processes P1, P2, P3 can um, access the entire address space. P3 and P4 are, are, for example, process P7 and P8 are user programs and they should not have access to certain parts of memory. So in other words, similar to memory protection unit, remember the memory protection unit that we talked about um, in ARM Cortex M3 microcontroller that isolates different regions of memory and protects them by assigning privileges. Even so, different processes are given different privileges and some processes have access to the entire memory space. Some processes do not have access to the entire memory space. Typically, um, processes with supervisor mode privilege have access to the, can change 
the contents of the entire memory but they are not user mode programs they are not programmed by user but user mode uh, processes they have limited um, accessibility they are act they are they can access only certain regions of address space okay so this is the idea of protecting certain regions of memory to ensure safety reliability and robustness of my embedded system applications now a process may create um, its child process and each of these um, child processes um, has its own data address space um, data status and stack um, resources now a process may create multiple threads um, a process may create multiple um, multiple um, threads each with its own stack and status information So we looked at um, what an operating system is. At the core, an operating system is a software that sits between the application software and the microcontroller hardware. Operating system is orchestrating and handling the job of um, multi-task, multitasking, orchestrating different tasks, scheduling them, so on and so forth and in that process we talked about what a task is and how they are scheduled by the operating system now let's look at threads what is a thread we we will be using this um term quite frequently thread now let's try to understand that a process or task is characterized by a collection of resources that are utilized to execute a program so in other words a processor needs a lot of resources the smallest subset of these resources is called a thread a thread is nothing but the smallest subset of these resources so typically the smallest subset includes a copy of the cpu registers the program counter and a stack Okay, so um, a thread is the smallest subset of resources needed to execute um, a task. Okay, so now we can understand the relationship between a process and a task. A process um, or a task needs threads. A process needs resources. A process needs multiple threads to execute. So threads are the resources that can make the process execute. So a process cannot do anything, it cannot execute if it does not have the necessary threads. So the subset of resources is called a lightweight thread and in contrast the process itself can be referred to as a heavyweight thread. So um, a thread is a unit of computation with code and context but no private data and here is the uh, big point that we want to understand a thread can be in only one process a process without a thread cannot do anything a process without a thread cannot do anything it, it simply uh, does not have the resources to execute. Now, in a single process, single thread system, there is just one thread, there is one process, and then CPU is available to this process um, for the entirety of its necessity. This model is called um, single process single thread system so during the execution of the um, task the thread uses the code or the firmware and data in CPU and other resources that have been allocated to the process 
Now, there can be multiple threads, multiple subset of resources, multiple subsets of resources. So, typically embedded systems simply perform a single dedicated primary function. But during the partitioning and functional decomposition of the um, embedded system, we have to identify which actions would perform, um, would benefit from parallel execution. Okay? For example, allocate a sub job for each of input output, um, for each type of input output peripherals. So each of the sub jobs has its own thread of execution. Okay? Such a system is called single process multiple threads so there can be there are um, so in other words there are four different kinds of systems so here is a single process the big cloud here is the process and the process has multiple threads and then cpu is still available to this just one process because there is no other process needing cpu now there can be different kinds of um, systems. There can be a system, um, four categories of multiple uh, multitasking operating systems. There can be single process, single thread system, which we saw earlier. And then there can be multi multi-process, single thread systems and single process, multiple thread system, which we just saw earlier, single process, multiple thread, and then multi-process multiple thread systems okay the main the fundamental distinguishing feature among each of these schemes um, is or that um, what resources the process and threads are using and where the resources come from so they're different for um, different uh, schemes Okay, so um, we looked at um, what a process is and what a task, what a thread is. Now, I mentioned that a process, um, earlier I mentioned earlier that a process needs a set of resources. It needs instructions, code. It needs data to operate on. It needs CPU registers. It needs a stack and it needs status information. In addition, it also needs a um, CPU okay so there are six resources altogether that are needed for a process to successfully um, execute and then um, some of these resources resources 1 2 and 3 the um, code the data and the um, 1 2 the tasks 1 into the um, resources 1 and 2 are shared among member threads but 3, 4 and 5 are proprietary to each thread. They are not shared among different threads. Now um, here is a complete software system with two processes and multiple threads. A software system and um, between the software system in the microcontroller unit. Hardware sits my operating system. My operating system does the function of scheduling, memory management and input-output um, drivers. Now let me, um, we have looked at the processor as a resource. I mentioned how processor is a valuable resource. It is available to each of the multiple tasks on a timeshare basis or based on their priority. Based on different criteria, um, the processor is available to the different tasks. But memory is also a very valuable resource, a very essential resource. And as, as such, memory has to be um, shared among different processes. Now, 
the way typically memory is shared is that the entire available memory is isolated into different um, address spaces, different delimited into different address spaces and each address space is assigned to one process. So in other words, a small chunk of memory is associated with one process. Another process gets a different um, chunk of memory and then it, it process 3 gets a third um, block of memory. What we want to do is we want to make sure that process 3 does not corrupt the address space or the memory contents of process 1. So we want to protect the memory region of process 1 from inadvertent corruption from process 3 for example. Or in other words we want to protect the contents of process 2 from being inadvertently corrupted by the program of by the program code of process 4 for example. So um, the system software must handle, must, must manage the memory. So we are talking about memory management in order to ensure the stability and reliability and robustness of my embedded systems. In order to do that, the processor should, uh, the, the operating system should um, manage memory. So we talked about how operating system manages uh, CPU time operating system handles scheduling of processor of tasks and processor perfect then it also handles memory management it also makes sure that memory is um, robust and it is not corrupted inadvertently pretty similar to the memory protection unit that we talked about earlier in ARM Cortex M3 okay and then this is handled this is done by the idea of um, privilege by setting different tasks have different privileges and depending on the privilege certain regions of memory may or may not be available to a task and so um, if a task by um, uh, mistake inadvertently uh, a user mode task with a lower privilege if it tries to um, change the contents of a memory um, that are beyond its scope then an interrupt is generated right let me say that one more time if a process tries to change memory that is beyond its scope then an interrupt is generated so in other words the operating system raises a an interrupt and says hold on um, something wrong is happening here process 2 you do not have permission to access that part of the memory okay so this job of um, protecting the memory can be handled by um, operating system okay and then ARM Cortex M3 has a really nice memory protection unit that is dedicated um, to work with the operating system to ensure the robustness of my um, code. Now, um, user mode, like I mentioned earlier, user mode has lower privileges. Supervisory or administration mode has higher privileges. H um, tasks with supervisory or administrative mode uh, privileges have access to the entire uh, memory space and typically um, they are um, they are delegated to the operating system so user mode tasks uh, have limited access but supervisory mode tasks have um, complete access to the entire memory space and then they're typically only um, used by operating system here is a um, here is a snapshot 
of memory supervisor um, mode tasks have access to the entire uh, memory but user mode has access only to a limited um, limited amount of the memory now so we talked about operating system performing the job of scheduling different tasks and managing CPU time as a resource we also talked about um, operating system managing my uh, memory I talked about um, operating system managing a memory now um, let's talk about um, process level management managing different processes okay a process may create we know um, or spawn child processes and parent processes may give a subset of their um, resources to each of their child um, processes we have to know that children uh, processes are separate processes and each has its own data address space data status and stack and the code portion of the address space is shared now a process may create multiple threads and the parent process shares most of its resources with each of the threads so these are not separate processes but um, separate threads of execution within the same process and each thread will have its own stack and status information now let's talk about um, re-entrant code let's say there are two tasks okay and then task one is said to be re-entering fundamentally re-entering let's try to understand this idea uh, a task one is said to be fundamentally re-entering if we can halt task one midway through execution jump to a different task and come back to pick up where we left off and continue so in other words a task that can be halted and continued later is called a re-entrant code or a re-entrant task and a task that has to be finished completely or uh, if you halt the task you have to begin from um, scratch that task is atomic or not re-entrant so let me say that one more time a task that can be halted and um, and picked up later and completed later is called a re-entrant task and a task that cannot be halted and resumed is called atomic task or not non reentrant tasks so let's get this really really um, um, clearly that functions using only local variables are inherently reentrant so in other words if there are global variables to a function it may be that these global variables can be changed uh, when the task is not running and then as such the tasks current state has um, is different from where we left off so we cannot resume where we left off okay so in other words if a task has certain aspects to it which are changed globally then uh, we cannot make it re-entrant only tasks with local variables are fundamentally re-entrant we can halt them and resume them at a later time okay a subroutine is called re-entrant if it can be interrupted in the middle of its execution and then safely called again um, that is called a re-entrant um, subroutine all right so we talked about what an operating system is um, what uh, 
scheduling considerations go into scheduling different tasks and what um, threads uh, are. We talked about that. So let's look at um, real-time operating systems really quickly. Okay, so we will talk about real-time operating system in a much more um, detailed fashion in the next class. We will talk about scheduling algorithms in the next class. Okay, but um, in a, a real-time operating system is an operating system in which there are um, hard deadlines for tasks. Okay, an operating system we definitely know provides um, these functions. It provides scheduling a task. It provides the function of dispatching a task to its run state and to make sure that um, data is transferred efficiently between the different tasks. Okay, so um, these are the job um, or jobs of um, operating system. Okay, now a kernel has um, is a subset of an operating system that performs the job of scheduling, dispatching, and inter-process communication. So a kernel is the smallest portion of the operating system that provides these functionalities. Now, um, the different um, functions that we saw earlier, the different Sorry about that. So the different um, services that we saw earlier are captured in the following um, services. Process or task management, memory management, I.O. system management, um, file system management, system protection, networking, and command interpretation. So these are the services provided by my operating system. An operating system provides the um, service of task management, memory management, input output system management, file system management, system protection, networking, and command interpretation. Now, a real-time operating system is something which has rigid time constraints. If the tasks um, in an operating system have to meet specific deadlines, then such a system is called a real-time operating system. And inherently, a real-time operating system has a deterministic behavior. Or in other words, you can precisely predict the next state and what happens um, after 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, what tasks are going to be um, executed in the next 20 milliseconds. So in other words, if you, you can guarantee um, the operation of certain tasks, then um, this real-time operating system is said to have a deterministic behavior. Now, um, there are a few um, definitions that we want to pay attention to. A real-time um, system is a software system um, with specific speed or res response time requirements. A soft real-time system is something we will come back to discuss in more detail about this. But a soft real-time system is a system in which if a task is not um, meeting its deadline, then the system has lower performance. So um, the performance of the system is low or medium or high based on if the task meets its deadline or not. That's a soft real-time system. A hard real-time system, on the other hand, does not give a grading as low, medium or high. There is only two values that are possible, pass or fail, success or fail. If a task that does not meet its deadline, then um, a hard real-time system is a failure. Now, a super hard real-time system mostly has periodic tasks. Um, 
Examples include operating system, tick and task compute times and uh, the deadlines are very short. Now, so um, an operating system typically has an onion scheme. We, we talked about the different uh, different functionalities that are provided by an operating system, and um, it typically has an onion scheme. On the top, we had an embedded system implica uh, application, and below that is a command interfa interface or command interpretation um, layer. And below that, we have memory management. And below that is the intertask communication um, layer. Below that is the CPU and resource um, sharing layer, which is scheduling or dispatching and thread management. Okay, um, Between the operating system, between the embedded application and the hardware, there is a nice onion model um, layer beneath layer beneath layer providing the different um, functionality that are needed uh, supported by the operating system. So this is organized organized like an onion model. The hierarchy is designed such that each layer uses functions or operations and services of the lower um, layers to increase modularity. What we will do is um, we will stop here. Um, we will come back to talk about some of the scheduling schemes. Here again is um, here again are the different examples of um, real-time operating systems that can be implemented on ARM Cortex M3 microcontroller. So what we have done in this lecture to summarize is to understand what an operating system does, what is an operating system, and uh, how it does the job of um, communicating between different processes, scheduling different processes, and handling different um, housekeeping, housekeeping jobs. We understood what threads are. Thread is a subset of resources needed to perform a task. And then we understood real-time operating system considerations. What um, constitutes a real-time operating system? An operating system that has to meet specific real-time um, deadlines, specific time deadlines is called a real-time operating system. And then some examples of uh, real-time operating systems that can function well with um, Cortex M3. In the next class, in the next class, we will come back to talk about um, scheduling algorithms in more detail. I will see you then.